we are from. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. <coughs>
Anyway, and then we have some of us that have, have been through a, some, enough of the school of life that we know there's no better place to be than on where the God's side and on a place where we can come and thank Him and, and worship Him. We talked last week about the whole month of, thing, of, of, uh, of November should be about Thanksgiving. In fact, the whole year that November fits in should be about Thanksgiving. Would you agree with that? Because how many times do we have things that we can look around and see things we could be thankful for? Reverend mentions often, often, wouldn't it be horrible to wake up one day and realize we can only have the things that we thank God for the day before? Wouldn't that be sad? Do we forget to thank God for everything? You know, I even had, I had a cousin that, that couldn't feel pain. I'm talking about physical pain. He could feel emotional pain. He couldn't feel physical pain. You say, well, I don't like pain. You know what? He had to be so careful because he would cut himself or burn himself and, and he didn't know to remove his hand or, or those kind of things. Did you know even pain is a blessing? It lets us know something's wrong. It lets us know to go a different way. We, we need to thank God for everything that he brings us through. Listen, we don't thank him for all things. We don't thank him for uh, when someone gets hurt or in, in all those kind of ways, but we can thank him through all things because he's the one that's big enough to help. So this should be a, a month of thankfulness. And, and what a, a great opportunity this week to thank our veterans as we did a while ago with, with applause. But like we said last week, that's not enough. In fact, we would... We come up so short and say thank you to those who have offered everything that we quit trying because we know it's not enough for what they did. Uh, when I would hear my, my great uncle speak about World War II and some of the horrific things that, that he saw as they were landing on beaches and all those kind of things, it, it's not enough to say, well, appreciate your service. It, it's not enough. I need to, to live a life of gratitude. Did anybody see the movie Saving Private Ryan? Uh, in the last scene, I hate it when Tom Hanks died. I didn't know, I'm sorry, if you hadn't seen it, that was a spoiler. But anyway, it, but, but at the end, he told Private Ryan, he said, your job is to go and live to the fullest because what all of these people did was give you that opportunity. And so go and live to the fullest. So one way we can say thank you to our precious veterans is live the life that, that we've been bought and, and paid for by their blood. And what we, what we can say to our Savior is... We're going to live a life that honors you because it was bought and paid for by your blood. So what a great month we have where we can focus on being thankful. You know, the Bible says, Greater love hath no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Than to lay down his life for his friends. If my two boys signed up for, for the National Guard, people would think, well, National Guard, that's, that's close, and that's hurricanes and all that kind of stuff. Well, both wound up getting deployed overseas, one, one in wartime and one in peacetime, but both wound up going overseas. And you know what? You don't know if they're coming back. And, and so before they signed, we told them, now remember, this is your choice. But remember the cost of what you're offering when you do this. I had no idea, I'll be honest, I was much older and supposed to be the mature but I had no idea of the cost that they could be paid whenever they signed up to get between you and I and, and the evil that would take over if we allowed it. And then I saw what war could do firsthand, or secondhand I guess you would say, but I saw firsthand what it could do to, to, to our precious young ones that go out and face it. And, and I had to tell my son about a year ago, said, I knew we asked you to, to risk life and limb. I didn't know that we asked you to risk sanity and family and all of the other things that go along with the horrible thing called war. And so I'm so thankful that people still stand up and say, you know what, so that my family won't have to face this, I will. I'm so thankful for my Savior who said, so that you won't have to face hell and death, I will. And he did. Greater love, love have no man than this. Love is not this sweet, gooey, fun stuff with a bunch of hugs all the time. Love usually costs something. And for everyone who took that oath and stepped up, guess what they offered everything. Whether it was taken from them or from their friend or their buddy, they all offered everything for us. So we need to be appreciative of our veterans. In Luke chapter 9, I want to talk to you about our greatest veteran. 
Our veterans have protected our nation. They, they bought us a nation where we have freedom. Sometimes we take it so for granted that we throw it away. But it, but it was precious and it was bought at a high price. You know what? Our salvation was bought at a high price. And, and our ultimate leader, our Lord Jesus Christ, He offered Himself completely in full knowledge what He was going to do. When, when our, our young men and, and ladies stepped forward to do that, they, they, they sign an oath to, to the Constitution of the United States. And that they're going to follow the, the leaders as they follow the Constitution. They, they say that. They, they got to do that because they get to pick who they're following and what they're following. We have an all-volunteer army now, or, or armed forces now. It's all volunteer. So everyone who wears that uniform did it by their choice. It's important that they know what they're signing up to. Would you agree with that? It's important to know, am I signing up to this Constitution thing? And what does it mean? And what are the other choices out there? And what did the Constitution say that it was going to be? It, it basically, Abraham Lincoln said this way, it's going to be a, a government of the people and by the people and for the people. It wasn't meant to be to put us under a dictator and, and not have the freedoms. But that, that's what it was supposed to be, and that's how it was set up. And, and our young people, had, and some not so young, step forward and say, I mean, I'll do that for my family, for, for, for those that are there that, that I love. Even for those that don't love me, I'm going to do it for them. And that's exactly a picture. Let's see. Mankind was created in whose image? God's image. So we have a picture of, of the love that Jesus Christ had for us and our soldiers. So the, the disciples of, of Jesus were there. But that means the followers. The guys that said, well, there's something special about this Jesus guy. Let's go check him out. And then they said, you know what? What he's got, I want. I want to be a part of that. And so one day they were sitting there and they said, and it happened that he, Jesus, was alone praying. Then his disciples joined him. Isn't that amazing? God in the flesh. Drew strength from prayer. The perfect one drew strength from prayer. That's, that's kind of important. Would you agree with that, church? If, if it's good enough for Jesus, is it good enough for us? I mean, if the one who was perfect in every way and knowledge and everything still submitted to prayer, still found peace in prayer, still found strength in, in prayer, wouldn't that be a pretty good hint that those of us who are not perfect... Those of us who come up weak and those of us that face problems that are way bigger than us, if he's pointing the way, don't you think we should do that too? Why don't we go ahead and do it right now? What do you think? Why don't we stand up and let's, let's pray to God? Listen, I'm going to be praying up here and I'm going to be making noise. You're going to hear my words, but you are welcome to talk to God, you and him, right where you're at during this time. Try not to miss opportunities for you and God to commune, amen? So let's bow our heads and talk to God. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and thank you for the privilege of coming to your throne. Thank you that we're not in a, in a place where, Lord, we can't go to the king. That we have to schedule appointments. That, that we have to uh, be of certain money or, or certain value or certain rank or and those kind of things. You say come anytime. Come as you are. You said that we could ask for wisdom and you would give it generously. And so, Lord, we come and we ask for wisdom. Lord, wisdom to make this life count. Wisdom to honor those that need to be honored. Wisdom to reach out to those that don't know what honor is yet. Lord, wisdom to, to help our families find you and learn to love that. Learn to love to the fullest and, and, and have a life that's significant. Wisdom to learn how to grow your kingdom, Lord, so that fewer people will be in hell and more will be in heaven. Wisdom to love each other, Father, whether we like what each other's doing or not. Lord, but to offer love, Father, the kind that you have. Sometimes the tough kind of love, the, the, the hard kind, the kind that, the Lord, you don't fall into, but you do it on purpose. And so, Father, I pray that you help us with that. I thank you for what you're going to do and what you're going to tell us today, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus was alone praying, and his disciples came and joined him, and he asked them, he says, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered back, and they said, well, they say that you're John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist was the one who came to announce the coming of the Messiah. He was the one, he was the announcer. And uh, but some say Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet. If you remember, Elijah didn't die. He was carried as on the chariot of fire to heaven after he had fought an amazing battle on Mount Carmel against all the prophets of Baal. He'd done many wonderful things in, in the, in, under the power of God. 
Others say that, that you're one of the old prophets who's risen again. Some people were speculating who Jesus was and is. Let me ask you something. Do people still speculate who Jesus is? If you ask the, the Islamic people, they will say he's a prophet. If you ask uh, uh, some of the atheists who are honest, they say, well, he's an amazing philosopher. You know, uh, given the, the, the secrets of life from a human point of view. Others say, well, he's somebody from back in history. We don't know if he was real or not. They, they will say all of those kind of things. But the question comes to this. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say? It, it's such an important question. It's so important that it's a critical question on where we're going to spend eternity. Romans 10, 9 says what? If you confess that Jesus is your Lord, your commander, your authority, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, he's special. Everybody don't get raised from the dead, do they? Not, not in that way. But, but just three days after, on the third day after he was killed, he's been buried. He's, he'd already been, they made sure he was dead. They just didn't let him die up there. When they got done, they went and checked him out. They jammed a spear in his side, and his body fluids ran out. They made sure that he was dead. Then they took him on the ground, they embalmed him. Then they stuck him in a cave and rolled a big old rock in front of him. Right? And on the third day, they went in, nothing was there, and he started showing himself to people. He showed them his scar, he showed them everything. And, and we know what happened. We know why that was so important that he was raised from the dead. He says, I am dying so that you can live. I am dying to take your punishment, and your punishment for your sin is death. And you know what? If you'll let me, if you'll follow me, I've got that for you. I'll be your substitute. And you say, well, how do you know God the Father accepted? Because on the third day, what did God the Father do? Praise God the Son. We believe in one God. It's pretty amazing. He can be one and do all those things at the same time. But he did. He raised him and then he walked around. He walked through walls. He appeared in rooms with the doors locked. He ate. He cooked breakfast. Guys, he might have been from South Louisiana. He liked to cook. Right? Outside. You know, he was a man's man. He, he worked with his hands until he, he went into the ministry and he still wasn't afraid. He still wasn't afraid to touch people whether they had leprosy or, or whether people called them horrible sinners and all those other kinds. He worked with his hands, didn't he? So he came back the same way. And then he stayed a little while. He says, I'm going, but I'm going to send the Comforter to you. And we know who the Comforter is, the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? Well, some places in the Bible says the Spirit of the Father. Other places, the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of Christ. So we know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God. And so instead of Him being in one place at one time, He can be with all of us at one time. Pretty amazing what took place on that day. So it's important that you know who Jesus is to you. If you've made him the Lord of your life, you Jesus, I accept you as my Lord. I'm all in. I know who you are. I know you were raised from the dead. The Bible says if you do that, says it on the wall over here, says it in your Bible in Romans 10, 9, you will be saved. You're on the winning team. Did you know that when the whole world comes to destruction, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will let people know about that, will convict the world of judgment. When it all comes to destruction, one thing will be left on this of this world. The old heavens, the old earth will be gone away. But a new one will come back. And a new heavens. But one thing will remain. What is it? The church. Who is the church? Everybody who made Jesus Lord. Everybody that, that believed that he was raised from the dead. Are saved and they're saved in this new heaven and new earth. We call it heaven. Pretty amazing stuff. Great stuff. So it's important that we know who Jesus is. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a philosopher. He's not just a good man. He's not just a guy in the world. He is the Word. He is what it's all about. He told him. He says, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, the Christ of God. What that means, Christ was the title. Christ was the Messiah. He was the promised one of God who was coming. Who was coming for you and me. He was the rescuer. How many of you ever watched the old the westerns whenever the, the, the guys were all pinned down and, and, and the enemy was out there and they were fixing to do the final attack and all of a sudden there was the sound of a trumpet? Who was coming? The cowman was coming, wasn't it? And I never saw him get beat on those westerns when they were coming. 
All of a sudden, the enemy fled, and, and everybody would, you know, and they kissed their horse and rode off in the wilderness. It was strange stuff, but, but every time all those babies, that's how it worked. The victory was there when the trumpet was sounded. Amen? Another day, the trumpet's going to sound, and the rescuer is coming for his own. And we talked just a week or so ago about, or a couple of weeks ago about Armageddon and the fact that when Jesus gets there and all the enemies are gathered, after that trumpet sound, what happens to the enemies? They're gone. They're gone. The, the war's over. Just when Jesus shows up. So it's happened. So it says, who do you say they And they said, you're the one. You're the rescuer. You're the Messiah. You're the one coming. <coughs> or don't you know, they had a right to be joyful, to know that no matter what happened in this life, they were going to share in the victory. We didn't have to kiss a horse. Right? They were going to share in the victory. Then look what he did. Look what he did. He strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one. He gave them an order. Men who, who are veterans, did y'all ever have to follow orders? Did y'all ever hear of those things? He gave them an order. And if you'd signed up, guess what you said when you signed up? I'm laying down all of my rights and I'm going to follow the orders. Did you know that that's what people say basically whenever they take their, their oath and whenever they go in and, and sign up for the army? It won't be, you know, uh, my sergeant said something that hurt my feelings. I'm bringing him up on charges right now. You have no right to say things that hurt my feelings. Is that, is that, is that what happened? Did, did guys who were there veterans? It didn't happen that way? You didn't have any sensitivity time? Okay. Uh, no, it was we have things to do. There's not time for that. We have people to rescue. There are people pinned down. Get the trumpet. We're going to help them out. Right? And there's not time for that. And, and so, Jesus gave an order. And since they were his followers, guess what they did? If they were really his followers, guess what they did? This is the rescuer. He gave an order. I'm a follower. I better do it. I'll give you another example. A rescuer. We often say the word savior, but we've gotten to where we don't even hear the word and what it means anymore. So I'm going to use the word rescuer. Let's say you're in the middle of the ocean. Right? And a rescuer flies down with a helicopter and he throws a rope down there. And he says, grab the rope. That's an order. And you say, I don't like ropes. I prefer the sharks in the 100,000 foot of water underneath me, however deep it is. What does the rescuer say? See ya. <laughs> Amen. He gave an order. And what is the order for? To help who? <coughs> to help who? What if the guy in the water says, who are you to tell me what to do? What if we don't understand there's a time to be submissive and when you're in front of the Lord, in front of the rescuer, He says, do this and I'll get you out of here. It's not a time to be, what's the opposite of submissive? Rebellious. Did you know that the Bible says that rebelliousness is as the sin of witchcraft? You say, well, wait a minute, how does that go with that? Well, what's witchcraft? Worshiping the power of the God. It's evil. There's no such thing as a good witch and a bad witch. If you're worshiping evil, it's, it's bad. If you're not worshiping God, then you, you miss Jesus, so you miss the way to heaven. And if you miss the way to heaven and you take others with you, that's pretty evil. How many of you want somebody who's not following Jesus to lead your kids away from Jesus? How many of you want that? Would you call that evil? There's one way to heaven, his name's Jesus. How would you like to say, no, we don't want to go with him because he's telling us what to do. Let's go this way. Well, what is away from Jesus? You have eternal life and eternal life. Death. So no matter how nice they are as they're saying, don't grab the rope from the rescuer, it's still evil, isn't it? It's still evil. He strictly warned and commanded to tell, tell no one this. But he said, let me tell you why. We have a strategy. We have a strategy. As I studied a little bit of history and I've talked to my veteran friends, in general, in general, they trusted their officers and the strategy. And listen, some of them trust them with some... <coughs> I think about climbing the cliffs on, on D-Day, that, that ranger group that, that climbed under fire up, up hundreds of foot, foot of cliff on ropes to get to the top and take out the guns so that their buddies could land on the shore without the cannons and artillery wiping them out. 
unreal what kind of strategy was that. You know what? They did it. They did it. Whatever the cost, they did it. But Jesus had a strategy. And he's going to tell you, here's the strategy, guys. The Son of Man. The Son of Man. He said, why? God came in the flesh. Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man. He was incarnated. He became flesh through Mary. Right? So he says, the Son of Man. He said it in humility, but it also said, this is who I am. The Son of Man must suffer many things. He said, guys, it's not going to be an easy battle. It's not going to be an easy battle. Now, let me ask you something. Would, uh, would you consider it sane if the commander said, look, we're sending about eight battalions. Probably only one company out of the last battalion will make it because it's a pretty tough, it's a pretty tough battle that we're going to have to do. And here's what our objective is. They've got a thimble over there in the other guy's headquarters. They've got a thimble that my mother-in-law really likes. So let's go get it. What would you say? No. Horribly no. The objective has to be big and it has to be something before you would risk so many. Right? Before you would risk one. The objective needs to be worth it. The Son of Man must suffer many things. He says, because my objective is worth it. Where is his objective? It's sitting in your chair right now. It's sitting beside you. It's these precious ones over here, colored at the coloring table. Right? That's his objective to reach. And he says, guys, we're going after it. And it's going to cost us something. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. Listen, by people, by people who claim to care about us. By the elders who are supposed to have wisdom. But they've only got earthly wisdom. They quit looking to God for wisdom. By, by who else? By the chief priests. The heads of what we call religion. The heads of what we call religion. We won't get to heaven through religion. We'll get to heaven through a relationship with our Lord. What relationship? He's Lord and I'm not. <laughs> Amen. And everybody say that. He's Lord and I'm not. Right? He's my commander. I'm the one that follows orders. He tells me where to go. And that's how I get there. If I go the way I want to go, I don't even know the way, as Thomas says. Jesus says, I am the way. The truth and the life. The scribes, that's those scholars, you know, the ones that get down and they study the, the religious law and all that kind of stuff. He says, I got to go against them because they're misleading you. They're turning it into some little game or some little uh, 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 tradition, set of traditions or, or, or this rule or that rule. He says, that won't get you there. They're not your rescuers. I am. But it's going to be costly. Son of man must suffer all these things. And finally be what? Killed. And that was important because the wages, God says, the punishment for sin is death. And he's not a liar. And I've sinned, so I owe a death. But Jesus said, you know what? I will do that for you. But to take care of my death, something had to die. And he says, I got it. I got it. I got this. He says it'd be killed. To be raised on the third day. Oh, Brother Darrell, we already knew that. It hadn't happened when he said it. Amen? It hadn't happened when he said it. He said it's coming. It's coming. Then he said to all of them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. How many of y'all heard that before? Let him deny himself. I told you about those, those kids sitting in our trailer houses back wherever or over here growing up and, and, and they're getting ready to sign that paper and telling them there's a cost. It's not, it's not all this, this glory and stuff. There's a cost. It's a, it's a big price. I said, you, you need to know that whether it's wartime or peacetime. You know, my great uncles were, were in, in, in World War II. Uh, my uncle was in, in Korean War and a couple of others of my relatives. My, my dad was in the Navy after the Korean War, before the, uh, before the uh, Vietnam War. And, and I had some cousins. I remember Gary Dean Burks just died a few years ago, probably from Agent Orange. And, and they had last, lasting effects. And I remember uh, some other friends uh, where we lived. It was odd. We had 
a row over here that's black families, and over here was white families, and some of them had the same last name as the black families and all that kind of stuff. And, and they lived in the metropolis of Bancroft, which you can see the back of one sign to another, and a bunch of uh, mailboxes on one board. You ever seen that? That was the post office. A bunch of mailboxes across one board. And then we lived about a half a mile past that, and I remember my dad, you know, my mom saying to my dad as we rode between the signs one day, when we got to the back sign, we were 18 miles south of Maryville, she said, Dad, we live in the country. <laughs> because we had passed through, through Bancroft. But several of our friends from, from the, the Bancroft community had, had also gone. And guess what every one of them did? The, the, the white boys from there, the black boys from there, guess what they did when they finished their tour? They signed back up, went back. They, they were what? They, they believed in, in, in what was going on. And they signed back up and went back. And they had also been in there so much that they didn't know how to fit in back in regular society. It was the only reality because it was so real that they could deal with. And they all signed up and went back and did a second tour. They knew what it would cost. Did you know that Jesus knew what it would cost? Let me show you something. Here's Revelations chapter 13 verse 8. Talking about at the end times. And it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship Him whose names have not been written in the book of the of life of the Lamb. Of the Lamb what? Slain from the foundation of the world. When was the strategy devised? From the foundation of the world. How long ago was that? I don't know. Long time before Jesus was incarnated, before He became flesh. Did He count the cost of coming into this world? It was already planned before the need was there. Did you know that God has the answer to your problem even before you had the problem? Did you know that? Why do we miss the answer? We're not where He had us to be. How many of us have missed God's plan for our life for, for, for times and times after times? And we'll miss it again probably because we, we can become so sensitized to things of the world that we become spiritually insensitive. Here's the great thing. The door is still open. And we can come back into His will. And we can find His answers. His answers may not always be easy. He didn't even make them easy on Himself, did He? But He knew what the cost was when He signed up to rescue you and me. And so it says, what? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Uh, I remember going after boot camp or during boot camp to see, to see the boys and they, they, they were probably 10 to 12 years apart. And boot camp was an interesting time in their lives. They were not the same kids that went six weeks later when they got out. They were not the same ones. I remember my foster son and, and stepson uh, going to the armory in, in Lake Charles and a sergeant walked in and they both stood so much at attention I thought they were going to fall over backwards. And the sergeant, he had been away from boot camp long enough. He just looked at him kind of funny. He said, guys, you're out of that now. It's okay. We're, we're to real life now. And all that kind of, yes, sergeant. They were still as stiff as a board. They were not the same people they were before they went. What happened? Oh, they were very nice to him. And they had massages three times a day? No. In fact, I remember Scott, when he went through, when he was going under the live machine gun fire, I don't think they allowed him to do that anymore, but they were going under the live machine gun fire in, in, in the mud under the barbed wire, and his, and his uh, shirt got hung. The sergeant went back under, because that's what a sergeant would do. Grabbed him, didn't undo the wire, just drug him, wire and all out. Ripped his shirt, ripped his back, but he got him out under those bullets. That, that's what it took. That's what would happen. In order to get ready to be our rescue, and they had to say, it's not about me anymore. Whatever it takes, I'm in. Whatever it takes, I'm in. Even boot camp. <laughs> Even facing face those nice talking sergeants. Right? Because that was getting them ready for the enemy. And if they didn't get ready for the enemy, then the enemy would take it. He said, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. What does that mean, take up his cross? Well, the cross was, was an execution tool. So let me say it in a way that's not as nice as take up the cross, because we've made that little piece of jewelry. Let him take up his electric chair daily. Let him take up his lethal injection daily. 
They take up his hangman's news daily. Wow. Wow. That's what it says. Now, did you know that God doesn't want you? I remember uh, anybody saw the movie Patton years ago. He says, your job's not to go die for your country. He says, you, your job to make some other guy die for his country. Patton talked pretty well, but he was in war. You know what? The Bible doesn't say your job is to die physically. In fact, it says present yourself as living sacrifices. Living sacrifices for God and honor Him. So what are we to, to what are we to die in? Well, we're to die to things that take us the wrong way. And if that means giving up this life and this body, then, then so be it. We're to die to things that take us the wrong way. If it's drugs, we're to die to that. If it's something that we're addicted to, then we, we can't get, get we, we've got to count ourselves dead to that. Any sin. Any sin. In fact, the Bible says that. Count yourself dead to that. We do this baptismal thing. What, what's that about? It says, well, I used to be this way. I was alive to all this stuff around here, but I'm dying to that. You can bury me right here. But then like Jesus, I'm going to come back and walk a different way. I'm dead to that other stuff. Satan comes and says, well, you did this. You deserve death eternally for this. And you say, no, nope, died to that. Buried. I'm in Christ Jesus now. Now, if you go and accuse a dead man at the cemetery of something that he did a while back, will the judge come to write out a warrant and the police come and arrest him and drag him out of the grave? Won't happen, will it? It's done. That's settled, right? So we're to die to the things that will used to lead us or mislead us and follow me. Die to things that, well, that's more comfortable over here, Jesus, and following you over there. Die to that. You know why? You can be comfortable. You can be comfortable and, and die and go to hell yourself or mislead other people. If you saw the movie, uh, what do you believe it was the other great one? What was God's not dead. And this precious lady sitting there and she's in dementia. And she's trying to talk to her wayward son. And she said, all of a sudden, clear as a bell. Did you know that, that people don't know it, but they're sitting in a cell until they meet Jesus. They're sitting in a cell on death row. And they're getting comfortable. The door's open right now. They can walk out of it, but they're sitting in there. And they get so comfortable in that cell that one day when the door shuts, it will be too late. But right now, they can just walk out if they want to. Did you know that that's the truth? Everyone who doesn't have Jesus is sitting on death row, but the door is open to get off death row. And who is the door? It's Jesus. And He died with His arms wide open for us. It says, take up His cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. What happens if none of our soldiers step between the enemy and us? Go read your history books about Hitler that says, well, today all I want is Austria. Today all I want is Poland. Every day, guess what he wanted? Another country. And then what did he do with them after he got them? If he didn't like you, he fed you to a furnace and annihilated millions. What if somebody says, well, I just don't believe in war. I hope you like barbecues. No, that's being silly and, and, and probably way too trite, but it's just how ridiculous it is. I don't like wars either. I hope I never have to use a weapon on somebody else. But if you come at my family, at my friends, against those who are standing for, for good and for positive, and I have a way to stop you from hurting them, unless the Lord says, don't you do it, Daryl, then chances are I will. I'll feel bad about it. I'll hate it. I'll pray for them. But I'm not going to let them hurt. The ones that are defenseless. So I thank you veterans for having that same idea and being willing to go and do those things. My, my wife has an ancestor who signed the Declaration of Independence and, and uh, we were looking at the history the other day and she said he was Presbyterian, bless his heart. But guess what he did? He donated a bunch of land for some Baptists and I think he's buried, buried in that cemetery up in New Jersey somewhere. And we talked about maybe getting to go see where that is. But because he signed that Declaration of Independence, he put a death warrant on himself. England, the most powerful nation in the world at the time, came after him. He spent the war in a cave. All of his money and stuff was confiscated or he gave it for the war. And he died penniless. 
Yet, if people had done that, where would we be? If we hadn't broken away from England, we'd be speaking English today. Have you ever thought of that? Instead of what we speak, which is a little different. Right? Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. If you want to save that life in that cell of, of, of supposed comfort, then that's all you've got. But in the end, where will you be? Still on death row. And you'll lose it. He says, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Whoever gives up his agenda and says, Jesus, you're my Lord. I know who you are. I know you were raised from the dead. I'm quit living in, for Daryl, and I'm going to start living for you. I'm going to give up that life, and I'm going to give this thing I got left to you, whatever you want to do with it. He says, you're going to save it for how long? Just eternity. Just eternity. For what profit is it to a man if he gains everything in the world, but he himself loses it? If he's got everything, what has he got when he quits breathing? You remember the story about Minus, King Minus? He loved gold so much and so he had a wish where he could touch and anything he touched turned to gold. And what happened? He wound up touching his granddaughter and, and, or his daughter, I forget which one it was. And, and so suddenly he had all the riches but nobody to share them with. It meant nothing. He just had a bunch of cold metal around him. Right? What if we got everything that the world had to offer and missed eternity with Jesus Christ? What would it mean? It is so hard sometimes to, to back up enough from the world to see that God offers really the only things worthwhile that there is, including the relationship, how we relate to one another, right? And once we get our relationship with Him right, we start relating to one another in different ways. And your needs become more important than my wants. That's, that's what you call what? Putting someone else's needs ahead of your own. That's, that's another word for loving somebody. You say, well, Brother Darrell, my heart doesn't go pee 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 pad or whatever they do when they walk by. No, it has a longing to help. The thing about that, that, that uh, chemical imbalance we call a crush is you can get over those. How many of y'all remember somebody in junior high that you're, you're about over now? How many of you are really glad when you've seen pictures of them since then that you're, you're over them? How many feel sorry for that poor person that got them? You know? If you want to help that person, that's love <laughs> with their real needs. But, but that, that infatuation is temporary. And it's not going to get anybody to heaven. But genuinely loving somebody, wanting the best for them, and helping them achieve in a godly way, and willing to give up your, your wants and trusting God to take care of those and helping them, that's genuine Christian love. And not asking a thing back. Your thing back is God just gave it to you. To want to help somebody and you saw that done and you know it pleases God, but, but you did it because that's His Spirit in you working. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? What is it? Then he says this, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words. Have y'all seen people ashamed of Jesus and His words? I see it more and more in popular culture. You see it on TV. Oh, that's those people who believe in Jesus. They, they, they worship at the altar of Jesus. No, the popular thing now is to, forgive me, but worship at the altar of climate change. Let's give all of our offerings and our time and our attention to climate change. Why? Because man's in charge of climate change. Who's in charge of our relationship with Jesus? God is. What, is. what does man want to be in charge of? Everything. I'm going to run this world. Should we take care of our climate? Absolutely. But he should become our what? Our God. I haven't heard, how many of y'all heard the President of Congress say, we need to go meet at the United Nations and have a big conference on remembering who Jesus Christ is. Have y'all heard him say that? How many of you have heard them say, we need to go to the United Nations and have a big conference on climate change? They say that. Why? 
Wow. What good is it to gain the whole world and stay here from climate change if we miss out on eternity? Amen? What good is it to gain the whole world and miss out on what Jesus has for us? I'm not being political there. I'm just dividing between what is Jesus and what the world thinks and the world's philosophies. For whoever is ashamed of me in my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory. Can you imagine people sitting in death row in their cell? And Jesus says, the time's come. What a shame as he shuts the door. What a shame. I died for him. I've lived for them. I set my armies out to love them and, and, and talk them out of that jail cell on death row. What a shame. Because he is here. What a shame. He said that he would be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. All of heaven don't want people to be in shame when he comes back. All of heaven wants people. It says the angels rejoice when another person says, Jesus is my way. Jesus is my Lord. I believe he is who he says he is. So as we end this, let me ask you something straight up. Who is Jesus to you? Our veterans are precious and they need to be honored earthly. But you know what? We have a veteran who's fought a war for us that needs to be honored eternally. Amen? Our veterans bought for us with blood the right to worship who we wanted to. And in that choice, I get to ask you, who, who is Jesus to you? If He's your Lord, and you mean it, and, and you've told, you've confessed it before others on this earth, because you're not ashamed of it, because you're not ashamed of it, then you won't be ashamed on that day. And He won't be closed against that one ashamed. He'll be saying, welcome. I got stuff for you that you've never seen before, you've never heard about before, your heart can't even imagine what I've got waiting for you. Amen? Folks, that's the gospel. That's the good news. Right now, you can take the hand of the rescue and say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I know who you are now. The Holy Spirit's told me, Brother Darrell shared it in his word, in, in not my word, but in your word. Right? You can do that. And listen, the scary thing is, many of us know it, <coughs> But we become complacent. The enemy is still marching and we're sitting here saying, got mine. Amen? When we have precious young ones and precious other people who are confused and hurt and don't know what to do with that God sent us out. Invitation is this. If you've never taken Jesus' hand as the Lord of your life, do so today, please. Come out of the cell of complacency. And join the army of God. And if you're in the army of God, say, where to next, leader? Where to next, Lord? I'm yours. Let's stand my friends. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us. Again, Father, we thank you for, for not leaving us in the dark. Not leaving us confused, but telling us straight up how things are. Thank you for not beating around the bush. Thank you for the price that you paid for us. Thank you for our veterans who have stepped forward with those, Lord, who also will, will celebrate, will celebrate, Lord, what they did on Memorial Day because they're not with us anymore. We pray for those precious ones who, who may have lost their way in this war because they, they don't know what to think about life anymore. About those, Lord, statistics say 22 a day are taking their own lives because they don't know how to live this one anymore. We pray for them. We plead for them. Lord, help us to honor them. But Father, we also know there are people who are going to miss heaven because they don't know what to do with this life. So Lord, give us wisdom and desire and love for them that they will reach out to them. And Father, for those that are ready right now to say, I'm ready to sign up, God. I counted the cost, and you're the best. You're the only way that's going to protect me and give me the opportunity to, to help my family. So Lord, I, I want that. So, Father, I pray whatever it is that your spirit is telling us today that we would say yes. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.